in the call to worship on your screen. Healing God, we come together in our brokenness to call to you in our mercy to make us whole again. Restoring God, we gather to worship you, even as we seek to be renewed and restored again. Foundational God, we come to praise and thank you. In the depths of your holy being, we find peace and rest. Will you pray with me? Daddy, today we are tired. Today we are worn down. Today we are grieving. Today we feel a little helpless and unsure of what is ahead. And yet, today you reign. As we come to worship, looking to hear a word from you, I ask that your spirit also bring us comfort, peace, and convict our hearts to be more turned to yours. We invite you into our spaces to bring rest to our weary souls, to bring refreshment where we feel we can no longer go on, to let tears be healing, and to bring the hope and the outcome of the work you have called us to do in our world, country, state, city, and neighborhoods. Fill our spaces and our hearts so we can hear you today to prepare us better to follow in the footsteps of Christ tomorrow and the day after. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome everyone who is watching today online on Facebook or YouTube or who is listening on 97.7 Guest FM. It is our honor to be worshiping with you wherever you join us from this morning. Lindenwood is a church that believes in the power of prayer. We want to remind you that if you have prayer requests at any point in time, email them to prayerrequest at lindenwoodcc.org. They'll be prayed over and sent out to our ministers and other prayer warriors. Now, I invite you to take a posture of prayer as we go before God this morning. Would you please join me in the unison prayer that you will find, find printed on our screen? Almighty God, you have charged us to be ministers of reconciliation. Give us the strength to persevere without counting the hurts and find within ourselves the capacity to keep on loving. Give us the grace to be able to stand in the middle of situations and to be a conduit for the deep listening which can lead to healing and forgiveness. Help us to conduct ourselves with dignity giving and expecting respect, moving from prayer to action, and from action back again to prayer. Grant that we may be so grounded in your love that our security is not threatened if we change our minds or begin to see a better way to act. May our words, spoken and written, lift up rather than draw, tear down, draw together rather than push apart. Bless us, and bless all who engage in this sacred work. Amen.
good and gracious God, calm the winds and the waves of our fear so that we can simply be still before you, vulnerable and calm. So much has ramped up the blood pressure of our soul this week. We come to worship today wanting relief, centeredness, and escape. Yet, O oh Lord, you comfort us in this world, not so that we can escape it. You send us right back out as ambassadors of reconciliation. Lord, I join with all in our country today, grieving the attacks of terror upon our nation's capital. We grieve for the loss of life, specifically Officer Brian Sicknick. Surround his family with love and mercy. Let us remember his name. We see the images of angry mobs on television and we say things like, that is not who we are. But, O oh Lord, deep in our hearts, we know that is exactly who we are. We are sinners. We are complicit in our sin through action and inaction. We play a larger part of contributing to the problem than we will ever admit. We have the same issues as Adam and Eve presenting ourselves better than we truly are, passing along blame to someone else. But your word teaches us, O oh God, there is not one who is righteous. Not one. Forgive us, O oh God, when we whitewash our vision of the past. The world is not getting worse. It is simply revealing what has always been there. It has been there the whole time. Therefore, we must hold tightly to each other and pull back on the veil that reveals our total depravity. So, Lord, let us cling tightly to you in these vulnerable moments. Let us reject the false idol of politics. Forgive us when we are evangelists much more for our political persuasion than we are a bloody cross and an empty tomb of our Savior. Lord, we want our faith to inform our policy, but politics is a golden calf. It demands ultimate allegiance and returns so very little. We had that put in front of us this week. Let us be reminded, O oh God, that as we who follow you, we follow a crucified Savior nailed to the cross by a government that demanded total compliance. We humble ourselves before you, O oh God, repenting of all allegiances that come before you. But we celebrate the gospel, Lord. You do not leave us where we are. Sin is not the final answer. You do not leave us in darkness. You do not leave us in our sin. Day after day, you summons us to come out of the darkness and into the light. Thank you for outbursts of light all around our city. Thank you for food drives managed by freezing volunteers. Thank you for ministries of care reminding the marginalized that they are precious in your sight, created in your image. Thank you for ministries of recovery that continue even through the pandemic, reminding people that they are more than a statistic, they are more than what would be deemed an addict, they are your beloved children. Thank you for outbursts of light. And oh God, thank you for this congregation, Lindenwood Christian Church, it is only by your grace that we are here and have attempted to plot along to offer a thriving alternative of inclusion through your grace to a divided, bitter, and idolatrous culture. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us to lay down our sinful lives and to take up our cross and experience cruciform living that comes through your nail-scarred hands. Bless us, O oh God, Break us, O oh God, 
Give us, O God, to a broken world so that we can be your ambassadors of reconciliation. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, we want to encourage you to join us in our communion hymn, number 523, Live in Charity, as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. At some point, you will grow tired of hearing me celebrate all the work that goes on with our food drive and our partnership with the Mid-South Food Bank, and people bring it up to me as if we've been doing it for seven years when we've really only been doing it for about seven months, but that's not accurate, actually. We've been giving away food for 178 years. For 178 years, this church has been giving away the food that truly nourishes. Now, I've never been hungry. Well, I've never been in hunger. <laughs> and I know that there are times that the literal bread of life will nourish you. But whatever situation you are in, the bread of life at this table will always nourish you. And so we as a church with a rich and deep history in this city have been inviting people to come to this table and to break bread and to drink of the cup and to be made right with God and with other people. We are truly remembered, put back together when we come together at this table. So at this time, I invite you to gather your elements as we prepare to share in the Lord's Supper and be reconnected to God and one another through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Would you please join me in the great thanksgiving found printed on your screen? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Father, you have promised that whoever eats of your flesh and drinks of your blood has eternal life. You have said you will raise them on that last day. Today we thank you for your promise and the hope that comes with it. Though times may appear to be dark, we have your pledge that shines as the dawn of a new day, a new era in which all your peoples shake off the trappings and sins of this world and unite in your glory. Thank you for the rooms that you have prepared for each of us and the love shown to us every day. Amen.
during the meal. Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul reminds us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us now, as one church scattered across not only the Mid-South, but the country, join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Having done this as a preacher since my senior year in college, I've learned two things. When I am prepared to speak, communion table, prayer, pulpit, I'm ready to go. And I can almost always stand by every word that I have prepared. Because hopefully I will have studied and prayed and polished it and made it ready to present in worship. But when I'm not prepared is when I get in trouble. When I talk off the cuff, when I'm not exactly sure what the next uh, paragraph is going to sound like, let alone how I'm going to finish the sentence. So I just want to warn you right now, I am not prepared for this. Mark called in uh, sick this morning, and I'm covering the table. And between the services, I was finalizing what I was going to say for the offering. So here it goes. Some of you are about to get a stimulus check that you may not need. If you have worked and been paid through this entire time, God bless you. If you are about to receive that and times have been lean, use it. I am not asking you to give your stimulus check to the church. I am asking you to reach out to me so that I can direct it to someone who might need it. I tend to be able to collect some knowledge of who might be going through a rough time. If you would like to be generous to a member of our church family or even somebody beyond our walls that we have a relationship with, I would love to facilitate your generosity. Again, if you need it, Use that for yourself, that's why it's there. But if everything has been pretty solid for you financially, ask God if you should use that to help a sister or brother in need in our congregation. My friends, it is offering time. Let us pray. Father, we stand before you in amazement at your infinite kindness and generosity. You have given so much. You have allowed us to share in the gift of your love and taught us to be good stewards of your gifts. Show us now how to give back as you have commanded. Open our hearts. Release us from the bindings of this all-consuming and selfish world. Allow our gifts to make a difference to your kingdom. Your will be done forever and ever. Amen.
I have this opportunity each week to give a pastoral moment, and I wanted to update you on something of, of note in our church. Today will be our first board meeting of the 2021 board. Now, in a world of violence and pandemic and COVID and hungry, I know that a church board update might not sound like the most exciting thing, but I'm here to tell you our board does good work, and I am grateful for their leadership in the time that I've been here. And I specifically want you to give thanks for Bill Hopper, who has been our board chair the last two years. I don't think these were quite the two years he signed up for, but they were the two years he got. And I ask that you pray for Rory Thomas, who at our board meeting this afternoon will be elected our new chair of the board for 2021. So let us be in prayer for our administrative board, those that are entrusted with the leadership of our congregation, and thank them for their service. Please stand for the reading of God's word from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I spent this last week in a doctoral seminar all day on Zoom with homework through the evening. And so trying to be uh, studious, I wrote this sermon a couple weeks ago and thinking, oh, well, this should be good for the second Sunday of January. And then we had a few things happen in the world. And so I had to go back and readdress a few things, even though the core of what I'm going to say, I believe, was providentially arranged for me to be able to share. I changed how I'm, what I'm saying in the middle, I'm changing how I'm closing, but I'm not changing how I begin. It was uncomfortable back in mid-December when I wrote it down. It was uncomfortable last week when I put the final touches on it. It was uncomfortable on Thursday when I began to rearrange it. It was uncomfortable this morning when I was trying to find a way to take it out. You only love God as much as the person you love the least. Let me say that again to get under your skin. You only love God as much as the person you love the least. Now, I hate that statement, and I want to push back on it. God, I love you, even though there's some people I don't like, and I worship you, and I sing to you. God, I love you. That's why I pray to you. God, I love you. That's why I read your word and don't listen to everybody else. I try to be grounded in Scripture. That's why I give to your church. That's why I try to obey the direction for my life that you have given me. God, I love you. What's that have to do with other people? One of the things about the Bible is uh, it takes truth and it puts it in your face and then it won't let it go away. Scripture sadly props up what I begin with. You only love God as much as the person that you love the least. 2 Corinthians 5 is a Bible verse I have camped out on, not only as a minister, but as a follower of Jesus Christ for almost as long as I have studied His Word. And it shows us the connection between our relationship with God and our relationship with other people that we are to love God and to be reconciled with other people. I put it this way, you only love God as much as the person you love the least. Paul is kind of right in the middle of a sidewinder of a sermon here, and he says that God was in Christ 
reconciling the world to himself and giving us the ministry of reconciliation. We were unplugged from the heart of God because of our sin, because of our disobedience, because of our stubbornness, and through the power of the gospel, of the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we were plugged back into heaven. God reached down and reconciled, reconnected us, put things back together. And then in my Bible, it's the same sentence. You don't even get a period or a paragraph. You have been reconciled to God so that you can be reconciled with other people. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself and entrusting us with this mission of reconciling with other people. Reconciliation is really just the balancing back to zero. Bringing things back together that were broken. A reconnection with God and with other people. And dare I say, if we are not connected with other people, have we truly connected with God? One year ago this week, I I preached a sermon that I honestly didn't think too much of, except that people have brought it back to me as helpful for them. One year ago, I preached a sermon where I said, you can forgive without reconciling, but you cannot reconcile without forgiving. I tried to make the point that forgiveness is a call for every disciple of Jesus. We are called, dare I say, commanded to forgive, to let that anger out of our heart, to let that poison out of our heart, to let go of the control of what another person did to us. But you may forgive someone and never speak to them again. If someone has abused you, don't you dare go back to that. You forgive, yes, but you are not reconciled. I stand by that. I think it's probably wise in situations. But I don't want any of us, myself included, to feel as if we are off the hook of the hard, holy work of being reconciled with the people around us for whom relationships have been broken and damaged. Now, it would be professional malpractice for me to tell you that this is easy. You don't wake up and put things back together with someone that, which the last time you spoke with them, you were yelling at each other. You do not reconcile and make things right because you prayed one prayer or made one phone call. Those can be the first good steps. But let's just put it all on the table right here. Reconciling with people is hard work. I don't know, especially on reflecting on this last week and honestly this last year, I don't know how to reconcile with those that would celebrate the death of a police officer, regardless of the context. I don't know how to reconcile in that relationship. I don't know how to reconcile with those that would destroy property, regardless of the passion that drove them to that situation. I don't know how to reconcile with those that would disagree with you, and not say agree to disagree, but think of you as less human because of thoughts that you have. Reconciliation is hard work. And dare I say, impossible work. Therefore, we need the Holy Spirit to help us be the ambassadors of putting the world back together. Just as Paul has taught us here. It's important. We're totally dependent upon God to do it. But it is essential that we explore it because we only love God as much as the person we love the least. Last week I said, it's a new year, but it's the same you. You're still the same, and let's be honest, the calendar is flipped, and I'm ready to give my seven-day trial of 2021 right back to them. The world is the same as it has been since Genesis 3, where we fail each other, we fail God, we shirk responsibility, and we blame other people for what we have done wrong. 
But the good news of the gospel, the good news of reconciliation, is that we do not have to camp out in that shame forever. The gift of the gospel invites us to be transparent before God and other people. You see, transparency, putting it all on the table, is the pathway to intimacy. Honesty is the pathway to intimacy with God and with other people. So if you want to learn how to take those first steps to be reconciled to God and to other people, let me give you a few marching orders. First thing I want to suggest is that you literally, not figuratively, literally get down on your knees and confess your sin to God. I know we're disciples of Christ. We don't always talk about this, but let's just get the uncomfortable truth on the table. We are sinners deserving judgment. We have failed God from the day we breathed our first breath. And anything we've done right in this world is only because of God's grace. We are asked to be transparent before God because God is gracious. And we ought not fear intimacy with God and transparency with God because God is gracious in light of our failure. So confess to God everything that you have done wrong as a pathway to intimacy with God and being reconnected. And then ask God to, pray, to go through and do a deep scope of your soul to look for all the sin that you're blind to, all the skin, sin that you want to cover up, all the sin that you explain away like you're Adam and Eve and repent on your knees that you have failed. And then once you engage in that reconciliation with God, find one other person and engage in what I call appropriate self-disclosure. Through appropriate self-disclosure, share your pain with another person and begin to reconnect with another person. If we want to be reconciled to God and to other people, the baseline of that is trust. Transparency creates trust. Owning people online does not create trust. Trying to have the last word in every conversation does not create trust. Correcting people or rolling your eyes in front of them or behind their back does not create trust. Transparency creates trust. And it's important that we do this because we only love God as much as the person we love the least. So if reconciliation is hard for you like it is for me, believe me, if you don't know where to begin, at least commit to being part of the solution. At least commit to being part of the solution by building bridges. I want you to know, every time you stand in this parking lot, this, this parking lot, and hand out food when it's so cold and rainy, you are being part of the solution and not part of the problem. Every time you are engaged in an amplified conversation with someone that should be face-to-face, -face, or at least screen-to-screen, -screen, and not typing-to-typing, -typing, I want you to know that you are engaging in the solution of listening without judgment. Every time you go out of your way to build bridges with someone that is different than you, you are part of the solution and offering your best to God to be an ambassador and an agent of reconciliation. And I'm just naive and old school, I would say. But I think we should at least share the gospel as much as we share our political opinions. I think Jesus should at least have as much equal standing of whoever is the chair of the executive branch on any given year. And when you share Christ with a lost world, you are committing to being part of the solution and not part of the problem.
But if you can't feed the hungry, and you can't ask questions, and you can't build bridges, and you can't share your faith, at least obey the command that Jesus gave us to pray for our enemies and bless those who persecute you. I saw the solution in a story yesterday that I read. After the Capitol building had been run over, taken over, and ransacked, it was finally secured and Congress reconvened. Between that time when every House or Senate member had to be on the floor, but after they had returned and had access to the Capitol, there was a member of Congress named Andy Kim. I don't know anything about him except he's from New Jersey. I don't know what party he's from. I don't know how he votes. I'm sure there's plenty of things I disagree with him about. But what I do know is this. Offices that were ransacked, computers that were stolen, windows that were shattered, feces that was spread on the walls. He left the security of his office and went down and spent time cleaning up the mess, the destruction, what had been a venue of violence not hours before. Here was this guy of power down on his hands and knees cleaning up reconciling, trying to figure out how to be part of the solution. I don't know much. I have two degrees in theology, halfway through a third. The further I go, the less I know. I don't know much. But what I do know is this. I am comfortable banking my life on this truth. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself and giving us the ministry of reconciliation. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. And I know, whether I like it or not, I only love God as much as the person I love the least. So Lindenwood, Memphis, America, we have got some work to do. And if you don't know where to begin, just memorize this victory verse. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself and giving us the ministry of reconciliation and reminding us that we only love God as much as the person we love the least. Let us pray together. Oh Lord, we know that the deepest darkness is not a place where grace goes to die. The deepest darkness is the place where grace goes to be reborn. Go to the darkest places of our hearts today, O oh God, that we might be born again. Go to the darkest places of our city, O oh God, that we might be born again. Go to the deepest places and darkest places of our poisonous culture so that we might be born again. Oh Lord, we know that the bold call from Your Word is only, only possible by submitting to Your authority. So, Lord, reign over our lives and let us surrender our agenda, our bias. Let us smash the golden calf and kneel and bow at the foot of the cross that saved a sinner even like me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would like to make Lindenwood Christian Church your church home this morning, if you would like to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, or if you would like to express your desire to be baptized, go to our website and click on the link in the upper right-hand corner that says Connect, and it will give you a simple form to fill out and give us an opportunity to follow up with you. 
But wherever you are in your faith journey, we hope that you will take seriously the next step of reconciliation with God and another person that you have been called to. At this time, we invite you to worship to hymn number 687 as we stand and sing, In Christ There Is No East or West. I invite you to stretch out your hands to be connected as one church virtually at this time. Let us open our hands and open our hearts to receive the benediction. God, we thank you for meeting us whatever place we find ourselves. There is a sanctuary of the heart inside of every person who follows you. We thank you for this time of worship of God, of music and of prayer, of gathering at your table, of giving back to you and your word being shared. Take all of this, O oh God, and use it as a guiding step, a path, a light, for whatever next decision we are to make in obedience to you. Now until we gather again, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.